I'm going to read just verse 15 and 16, and I want you to follow along with me. Paul says, Wherefore, or for this reason, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you. Here it is, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, Paul the Apostle has, from verse 3 down to verse 14, and we spent three weeks given us a list of the blessings that are ours in Christ. Someone packaged it like this. He blessed us immensely. He chose us unconditionally. He adopted us adorningly. He redeemed us graciously. He forgave us completely. He showed us grace lavishly. He revealed his mystery wisely. He granted us an inheritance eternally. He sealed us permanently, and he guaranteed our salvation personally. Those are all the blessings, the top 10 blessings that God has given to us because of our position in Christ. But as I said, Paul now moves from the praise for the blessings that God has given us to the prayer that the eyes of our understanding, or some translations have heart, might be open to know what is the hope of our calling, what is the riches of our inheritance in the saints, and what is the power of God for available for us to live the Christian life. So Paul was in prison, but his preaching and his pen, and even more powerfully, his prayers had great effect. Now I want to outline where we're going to go, and then we'll go back and cover it. But in verse 15 and 16, we're going to see the purpose Paul prayed, the purpose for Paul's prayer. Then in verse 17 to verse 19, we see the actual petitions of Paul's prayer. There's really only one petition, then he breaks it down into three aspects. And then verse 20 down to verse 23, we see the proof of God's power. So we have, first of all, the purpose, then the positions, and then the proof of God's power. Let's look, first of all, at verse 15 and 16, at the reason or the purpose Paul prayed. Go back there with me. Paul says, wherefore, or for this reason, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all the saints, this is what Paul did in light of that, I cease not to give thanks for you and I make mention of you in my prayers. So Paul is thankful to God and he's praying to God. I'm thankful for you and I'm praying for you. When you think of others in the family of God, do you thank God for them? And do you pray for them? When God brings someone to mind, we should give thanks and we should give intercessory prayer. So Paul is praying for them. Notice for the reasons, verse 15. Because they had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they had love to all the saints. Faith and love. Because they trusted the Savior and how they treated the saints. Now this is kind of a dynamic duo, the identifying mark of a true believer. What is a true believer? A true believer is a person that has put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? We sing, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And that's what we do. We stand alone in faith and trust in Jesus. How are we saved? By grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So that's the initial faith of salvation. But once you have been born again by faith, then it starts a life of faith, a sanctifying life of trusting God and believing in God and hoping in God for your daily needs. You must put your faith and your trust and your hope in God. The Bible says the just shall live by what? By faith. One of the greatest verses in the Bible from the book of Habakkuk. The just shall live by his or her faith. So Paul says, look, I'm so glad that you have faith. Now notice what the object of their faith was. The Lord Jesus. He says, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus. Again, when we get to verse 17, he mentions our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus, who is Lord, they put their faith in Christ as Savior and Lord. And they're trusting Him, they're walking in Him, they're believing Him. That's the mark of a believer. And then if you have genuine, authentic faith in Jesus, guess what happens? You have love to all the saints. 
Now, I looked at that word all, by the way, in the Greek, and I discovered it means all. I was hoping it meant some or just a few or just the ones you like, but it meant all the saints. To live above with the saints in love, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints I know, brother, that's another story. We don't always get along in the body of Christ, but we are to love one another. But let me tell you what is a birthmark of the believer. You know what every believer has as a birthmark? Love. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my, what? Disciples, that you have love one for another. Love is the identifying mark of a true believer. These are the two aspects. We have faith in Jesus Christ, and we have love to all the saints. So we look up to God in faith, we look out in love to the body of Christ. And we are to love one another. Even when the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts, we love all people. That's one of the indications that you've been born again because you love like God. If God is love, his children should be practicing love as well. So for these two reasons, they trusted the Savior and they treated the saints with love. And by the way, when you get to Revelation chapter 2 and the Lord has a message for the church at Ephesus, what sadly had they lost? Their first love. The same church at Ephesus where Paul says, I'm thankful for your faith and your love. When the Lord spoke to them in Revelation, he says, you have left your first love. So would to God that we stay in his word, trusting him, and that we continue to love one another. So Paul was thankful and he was prayerful. Now, before we look at the petitions of the prayer, I want to remind you that you can use Paul's prayer to pray for yourself and to pray for one another. Have you ever got down to pray and you don't really know what to say? Uh, Lord, bless my wife, bless my children, bless my grandchildren, and bless my pastor. You can pray that every day if you want. (laughs) Throw that in there. He needs all the help he can get. And we we don't really know how to pray specifically. I'm going to give you a pattern for prayer in verse 17 down to verse 19, where Paul describes the petitions of which he is praying. So we move from the purpose of prayer to the petitions of prayer. Let's read verse 17 to verse 19. Paul says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. No problem there either to refer to the Father as the God of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus hung on the cross? What did he say? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In his humanity, sometimes the Father was referred to as my God. After his resurrection, he says, I'm going to go back to my God and to your God. So Jesus referred to the Father as his God. So the person that Paul is praying to, and this is who we address prayer to, is God the Father. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and I love that title, he's the Father of glory, that he may give unto you. And here's the petition. It appears at the end of verse 17 and at the beginning of verse 18. And I, I really believe that he takes two ways to describe his one petition. The first is he says that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him may be given to you. And then secondly, in verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. Now, I want you to understand this passage. I'm convinced after studying it many years that Paul basically has one petition. And his one petition is described at the end of verse 17, that you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And then he uses different phrases to say the same thing. I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. Basically, Paul is praying there that they would experience what they already have, that they would come to a fuller, richer, more intimate, powerful, personal relationship with God. Now, notice quickly that Paul doesn't pray for their material needs. He doesn't pray for their marital problems. He doesn't pray for their physical ailments. Now, it's not wrong to do that. 
And when we have needs, we'd pray. But many times, here's the problem. That's all we do is, Lord, I need more money. Lord, I need a new car. Lord, I need a new house. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. It's kind of like a shopping list. In Jesus' name, amen. I need it by Friday at 3 o'clock. Lord, I need help in my marriage, and I need this. And I, and I understand that. God wants us to pray for those things. But they should not be the priority of our prayers. They should not be the passion of our hearts. When Jesus taught us how to pray in what we call the Lord's Prayer, it's really the disciples' prayer, how does it start? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It starts with praise. Praise your holy name. Praise should be the priority of prayer. And then it moves to petition, but notice the first petition. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before we even ask God for daily bread, we should ask God for his will to be done. Child of God should never be afraid of the will of God. It is good and acceptable and perfect. And we should want God's will in every area of our lives. So we start with praise and we make the priority God's kingdom. And that's where Paul started. And I, I think there's a truth here we need to catch that when we get right with God, when the eyes of our understanding are open, when our heart is open, we understand who we are in Christ, God's blessings, and we are right with God, we experience his power, our marriage will be what it should be. Our health will be not an issue. Our finances, our jobs, our careers, those are concerns, but they pale in perspective to my relationship to God. Many times we're trying to treat symptoms, and we want answers to our problems. Our problem is we need to be right with God. We need to know Him and the power of His resurrection. We need to be in fellowship with Him. We need to be in relationship with Him. It's so important to get that perspective that my vertical relationship to God is the priority and my horizontal relationships will come into play and the balance when I'm right with God. If you're working on a problem in your marriage right now, get on your knees, pray, and spend time in His Word yielding to the Holy Spirit. That's my marriage counsel to you today. Ask God to soften your heart, open your heart, change your heart. Be willing to repent of any sin and turn to God. And God will work in your marriage. God will heal and work in your situation. But you need to get focused right. So what does Paul pray for? He prays that they would know by experience what they already have. Paul prays that they might know God personally, intimately, and powerfully. Go back to verse 17. The word knowledge is an interesting Greek word. It's not just the word gnosis. It's the word epignosis. The word epignosis, with that prefix, means an overflowing, experiential, personal knowledge. You see, you don't just come to know God in salvation, but it's a whole lifelong pursuit of sanctification, of knowing Him better. This is why Paul said in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him. 30 years after his conversion on the road to Damascus. He's writing to the church of Philippi, and he says, I want to know him. You're thinking, Paul, you've known him for 30 years. I want to know him better. I want to know him experientially. I want to know him powerfully. I want to know him intimately. Is that the passion of your heart, pursuing God and knowing God? That's what Paul is praying for. Notice in verse 18, he says, I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. So the spirit of wisdom, and I believe that should be the Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom in God's Word and reveals Christ to us, changes us into His image, gives us a knowledge of Him through His Word. And then our eyes are opened in verse 18, and our understanding is enlightened. Now that phrase, the eyes are enlightened, or your understanding, some translations actually have the eyes of your heart, and I love that. Many times before I preach, I'll pray, God, open our heart, open our eyes, open our ears. I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about spiritually. A lot of people don't hear the Word of God. They don't receive the Word. They don't see the truths of God. They don't receive it because their eyes and their hearts and their ears are not open. So even as believers, we need to have a receptivity 
that we might have a knowledge of Him, an overflowing experiential knowledge. So we ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, I believe that the mind or the heart opened is referring to our mind, our emotion, and our will. And how does that happen? We know God personally in salvation. We know God increasingly in sanctification. And we know God perfectly when we are glorified in glorification. So we're first saved, then we grow in sanctification, then one day we see Him face to face and we know Him perfectly. Now, I believe as far as the text is concerned, that's the petition. That's the petition. I want you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of Him. I want your eyes to be open that you might be enlightened. Now, He breaks it down for us. And he amplifies on that. It's kind of a, a Greek pattern of staking the preposition and then going deeper and explaining it. And there are three key words, all of them the same. He says, what is the hope of his calling? What is the riches of his inheritance in the saints? In verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? So three times in verse 18, twice what? What? In verse 19, what? I've taken that word what in verse 18 and verse 19, and I've highlighted it in my Bible. Those are the keys. Those are the three things that he amplifies on that he wants us to understand. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. First of all, in verse 18, he wants us to know what is the hope of our calling? What is the hope of our calling? Now, the calling reaches back into eternity past, and the hope goes off into eternity future. So we look back, God called us by His grace, right? Remember chapter 1, where it says that the Father chose us in Him before the foundations of the world? Just to think that God chose me, and that He called me by His grace. What has He called me to? He's called me unto heaven. All through the Bible, the Scriptures use this concept of being called by God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Galatians 1, verse 15. Paul says, God called me by His grace. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter says, He called out of darkness into His marvelous light. You know, the church is called the, the ecclesia, the called out assembly. The word church is the Greek word ekklesia. It means called out assembly. So we as a people are called by God out of darkness into light, called into fellowship, called to worship, called to evangelism, called to reach out to the world around us. And one day we're going to be called up to heaven. I love that. I could dig that today. To hear the trumpet sound. The dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be called up to meet Him in the air. What a glorious truth that is. We as the church are the called of Jesus Christ. That's why we have a 1 Peter 1.3, living hope. That's why we have a blessed hope, Titus 3, uh, 2, verse 13. And that's why we have a sure hope. So we're called to a living hope a blessed hope, and a sure hope. Titus 2.13 says, we're looking for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. You know, that blessed hope, that call of God to that blessed hope of heaven should motivate us to live pure lives and to work zealously for the Lord. Now, if I were to summarize this first petition, the hope of his calling, basically it's that you as a believer could have assurance. I believe the Bible wants us to have assurance that we should know that we're saved. We should know we're God's children. We can know who we are in Christ. You can't live the Christian life if you don't know you're a Christian. So you need to have that blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory 
divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, washed in His blood, filled with the Spirit, looking for that blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So basically he's saying, I, I want you to understand that you're saved, and that you're on your way to heaven. Notice the second breakdown of this petition is in verse 18. He wants us to know what, there's the key word, is the riches of God's inheritance in the saints. Now again, there's two different ways that this could be interpreted. Statement could mean that we are his inheritance, and that's taught in the first chapter and true. Or it could mean in the context, more likely, it's referring to our inheritance. That we have an inheritance laid up for us, incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, it's reserved in heaven for us. Remember he told us that one of the blessings were that we've been given the earnest of the Holy Spirit. And that earnest is a down payment, it's an engagement ring, it's a taste of heaven right now on earth. It's a foretaste of heaven. And so he's actually saying two things. I want you to know that you're saved and you're going to heaven. And I want you to realize how glorious and wonderful heaven is going to be. You know that we used to sing heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory, filled with grace. I'm going to see my Savior's face. What a blessed song. And when we get to heaven, the first thing we're going to do is look upon the face of Jesus Christ who called us by His grace and saved us, washed us in His blood. Faith becomes sight. And you're going to be able to actually reach out and touch the face of Jesus Christ. Glorious, glorious, glorious day. You ever had a near-death experience? I, I, I had one real bona fide near-death experience. I was kidnapped at gunpoint. For a couple hours, I had a gun held to my head. Thought for sure they pulled the trigger and I would be dead, but I can't tell you the peace that got filled my heart. A sense of any moment now, I will see the face of Jesus. What a blessed hope that is. So we know we're going to go to heaven, and when we get to heaven, we're going to see Jesus, and that's going to be glorious, and then we're going to be like Him. Our bodies are going to be transformed. There'll be no more sickness, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more sadness. Heaven's been called the land of no more. For all the former things are passed away. So here the key is the scope of your hope. So we have the hope of heaven, the scope of heaven. I will see Jesus. I will be like him. No more sin, no more sickness, no more sadness, no more sorrow. You say, well, John, doesn't that mean that you're kind of heavenly minded and you won't be any earthly good? No, just the opposite. The problem with the church today is that we're so earthly minded, we're of no heavenly good. Paul's prayer is a prayer that our hearts and minds will be open to the reality of our eternal home and the blessings that are ours right now in Christ and that we live in light of them. I believe that that motivates us, as I said, to purity and to good works. But there's a third breakdown of this prayer. The first is, what is the hope of his calling? The second is, what is the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? And here's the third, verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of his power, his dunamis, his dynamic power, to us word, or you and I who believe? God provides power for us as believers according to the working, notice that statement, of his mighty power. And in verse 20 to 23, he goes on to give the proof or a pattern in the person of Jesus Christ of God's power. So he wants us to know the greatness of his power. This is the way it would break down. God's calling looks back at salvation. God's inheritance looks forward, that's glorification. And God's power looks around that's our present sanctification. This is Paul's main focus in the petition. Paul wants us to know God's power. The child of God has the power of God to help them face the problems of life. God provides you power. You're struggling with temptation. You're struggling with some besetting sin. God has provided to you the power. The Bible says there's no temptation taken you, but what is common to man. 
And God is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation do what? Make the way for you to escape. So don't tell me you couldn't help yourself. I know you can't help yourself. I can't either, but God can help us. Amen. Our problem is we don't look to God. We don't hope in God. We don't trust in God. We don't rely upon God. We need to be filled with His Spirit, surrendering to Him as Lord. And we can walk in victory and conquer those temptations. God will give you power. Again, if you're struggling in your marriage, and God opens the eyes of your understanding, and you understand your position in Christ and the hope that you have, and you rely upon God's power, He brings healing to your home, brings healing to your heart brings healing to your situation. But it all starts with your relationship to God. And the power is available for us in Christ. Christians have power. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. I believe that that's where the power lies. You have the presence of the Spirit. You are indwelt by the Spirit. But you need to surrender to Him and have Him control your life. Now, notice how He breaks it down. And this is our third and last section, verse 20 to 23. This is proof of God's power. And He does three things. He talks about the resurrection of Christ, the exaltation of Christ, and the headship of Christ. Notice verse 20 to 23. He says, "...which He wrought in Christ." Now, He mentions at the end of verse 19, His mighty power. Now he's going to give us a picture or pattern or proof of that mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, verse 20, when he, what? Raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies, and he was above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he's put all things under his feet and given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, I want you to note the proof of God's power as seen in the person of Jesus Christ. Number one, in his resurrection. Notice that in verse 20, he raised him from the dead. Stop right there. That's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You talk about power. Jesus Christ went to a cross, died physically, suffered in agony, felt your pain, took your shame, took your sin, suffered and died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. Then he was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. Amen? Amen. He conquered sin, death, and the grave. Now, when Jesus came out of the grave, he came out of the grave in a glorified, eternal, immortal body. He didn't come back in the same body. It was the same body, excuse me, same body, but now metamorphosized, transformed into a glorified body, never to die again. Now, Jesus is the first and so far the only one who has ever been resurrected from the dead in a glorified body, never to die again. But he's the first in a long train. It's called the first fruits of those who sleep. Our bodies will be resurrected like his. So you talk about power. Here he is. like You know, there's, there's no medical science. There's no medical assistance that could revive him. Dead for three days. And not only alive, but alive in an eternal, glorified, immortal body, never to die again. That means he's alive right now. So Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And that leads to the next statement that he is exalted. Note at the end of verse 20 that he set him at his own right hand. That's the place of exaltation. In the heavenly places. Far above, verse 21, all principality and power, might and dominion. Every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So whether you have good angels or bad angels, whether you have kings or those who are in authority, Jesus Christ has been set up as superior as the sovereign over them. And then notice in verse 22, he hath put all things under his feet. David prophesied of this in Psalms, 
Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. In Philippians chapter 2, it says God has given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is the exalted Savior right now, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, the place of authority and exaltation. So we have this crucifixion, we have this resurrection, we have his ascension and his exaltation. That's the power that's available to you. That same Christ that rose from the dead is living in you. It's interesting, the power of God could raise Jesus from the dead but we can't get out of bed in the morning to pray. <laughs> Call it blanket victory. I thought about that this morning when the alarm went. Oh, Lord, give me strength. Lord, get me out of bed. Lord, help me. How much power does it take to get you out of bed? <laughs> Same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> to give you the strength to... To be a loving husband, a submissive wife, an obedient child. To live a life of godliness and purity and obedience to God. I remember as a young Christian, so discouraged, I thought, I can't live the Christian life. I, I, I can't live this way. It's too difficult. And as I fell to my knees and cried out to God, I felt this new strength and the new power come into me. You know where God's power and God's strength is most manifest and evident? In your weakness not in your strengths. When I see a self-confident Christian, I can do it, I'm a good person, I can live for the Lord, I think, oh no, I don't want to watch. <laughs> and after the crash and the cry, oh, help, the Lord comes to our rescue, amen? amen? Paul said, for when I am weak, then am I what? Strong. The power of Christ may rest upon me in my weakness. If you're experiencing weakness right now, that's the secret to strength. Rely upon God. Look to God. Let Him strengthen you in your hour of need. So we have the power of His resurrection. We have the glory of His exaltation. And thirdly and lastly, verse 22 and 23, we have His headship of the church. Christ is the living head of the body of the church. Notice it in verse 22 gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. We're united to him, the living head. He supplies everything we need, which is the fullness of him that dwells all in all. No human being is the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, amen? Amen. He's both the foundation and the head of the church. By the way, Jesus is the pastor of the church. Any man that calls himself a pastor is just an under-shepherd, and we are under the shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. You are his sheep. You're not my sheep, and I'm kind of glad you're not. Because <laughs> sheep are messy and smelly. So I can just kind of commit them to God. God, these are your sheep. Take care of them. And he does. How wonderfully he takes care of his people. He guides us as the good shepherd. He gave his life as the good shepherd of the sheep. So he's the living head. So he rose from the dead. That's power. He's exalted at the right hand of God the Father. That's power. He's the living head that we're united to and we can draw from. And you know what the head speaks? It speaks of care and guidance and protection. And provision. God provides, He protects, and He cares, and He guides the church. And we're all united together and united to Him. So to summarize what we've studied the last several weeks in light of this morning's prayer, Paul wants us to know God experientially. He wants us to appropriate our riches fully, and He wants us to experience His power victoriously. How do we do that? Through the Scriptures, through prayer, through suffering, and through the surrender of our lives to the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what we read this morning? We read a pastor's prayer for his people. This is my prayer 
for you, God's people. And you can take this prayer as a pattern any day you want, and you can pray it for me, that God would open up the eyes of my heart, the eyes of my understanding, that I might know what is the hope of my calling, what is the riches of my inheritance, and what is the power that's available to me in Christ. Let's pray.